Welcome to the podcast of the Political Page blog with commentary from an attorney and entrepreneur on the political and social issues of the day from a rationalist, libertarian, and often irreverent perspective. This is Political Page, and here's what's on my mind today. Hello and welcome to the blog of the 20th of June, 2019. This one is entitled, It's the Enthusiasm, Stupid. Now, we remember a lot of things about Bill Clinton, right? Some of them are not such savory reminiscences, but that's okay. In one particular, he was a genius for the ages. If you will remember, he knew his voters. I mean, he was surrounded by these highly paid minions, and they were scrambling to microanalyze every aspect of his campaign among each ever more finely cut sub-demographic and the myriad of issues swirling around every national election, and he just cut across all of them. He looked at them and he said, it's the economy, stupid. Hmm. And for that election, indeed, it really was. In fact, if Donald Trump has unleashed an American economy that is eclipsing every record for the past century or so, by Clinton's measure, we should just do away with the billion dollars or so this election is going to cost us and just appoint Trump by acclamation. But we are not in Bill Clinton's day. This is a different era. And this is an era where the optics that once mirrored a campaign now have come to define it. We have 24-7 visual auditory information streams. Those optics, the crowds, the chants, the energy, and yes, even what I would call the joy, they all lead to that one all-important intangible bit of magic that we can call, for want of a better word, enthusiasm. The enthusiasm to attend, to donate, and the ultimate determinant, obviously, of any American election, enthusiasm to turn out and poke that button on the voting screen. Enthusiasm, turnout, votes. And it's the reason we have three levels of polling. We have all Americans, registered voters, and likely voters trying to figure out not so much who believes what, but who's going to vote on it. And I would argue at this point, really, there is no reason to have three levels of polling anymore because all American polls are utterly irrelevant. Registered voter polls have some relevancy, but almost everybody has been registered to vote now. You've got motor voting laws. Heck, I think they've registered more dead people than they have alive people, but the dead people don't show up to vote. Okay, so doing a registered voter poll means very little, if anything. In fact, I think they're kind of dangerous because basically most registered voter polls today have become what we used to call push polls. In other words, a a pollster calls you up and they're not asking you really what your opinion is. They're, They're phrasing the question in such a way that they're feeding you their propaganda. They're not trying to find out your opinion. They're trying to sway it. It's a push poll. And I will tell you that most registered voter polls right now are push polls. And you know why? Well, first of all, consider the source, right? In almost anything you're looking at, consider the source. These are the same media organizations that spent the entire 2016 election cycle assuring us that there was really no point in us going out to vote because Hillary Clinton had a 98% chance of becoming the president of the United States. So number one, consider the source. Number two, consider what they're finding. Seriously, they are finding that almost every non-entity Democratic presidential candidate beats Donald Trump in almost all the critical states by double digits. Again, there's just almost no point in showing up anymore, is there? You see the push-pull aspect of that? And, of course, they're predicting wrong. They predicted wrong in 2016, and they're predicting wrong things today. But prediction is not the point of the polls. They're purchased and they're released for the sole purpose of creating an expectation in the public, an expectation in us, that the re-election of the sitting president in the best economy since World War II is not a given, despite history and notwithstanding the most uh, egregiously painful enthusiasm gap in modern history between Trump's party and that of his opponents. And you want to know something, the newspaper that most recently really succumbed to the worst case of Trump derangement syndrome that I've seen, and boy, there have been some bad ones out there, willing to accept any warm body, not a specific person, any person in lieu of this president, regardless of that person's policy position, moral fiber, physical health, hell, even their mental stability, was, ironically enough, the Orlando Sentinel. Now, why do I find that anti-endorsement ironic? After all, the Orlando Sentinel has endorsed three Democratic candidates in the last four presidential elections. You'd expect them to be that way. Well, it's ironic because it's Orlando. And Orlando is where Trump chose to make his announcement that he is once again running for the presidency of the United States. 
Their city, the city that had to put up facilities to shelter and serve the hundreds and then thousands of supporters who showed up days or many hours before the rally, the city that had to shut down huge chunks of its downtown, even access points to the critical I-4 artery to accommodate those crowds, the city that had massive police presence around the 20,000-seat Amway Arena that Trump supporters packed to overflowing to cheer his announcement but didn't need that police presence at all, the city that had to double its rail service and put emergency parking rules and emergency shuttles from their airport to handle the surge of these energetic Americans arriving from all over the nation to be part of history. That city has a newspaper that said anybody but Trump is preferable. Well, I'll tell you, the Orlando Sentinel has somewhat of a disconnect with its readers, and I wonder if they ever even look out of the windows of their offices. No, their enthusiasm is all saved for the likes of Joe Biden. And that brings us to old sleepy Uncle Joe. Because sleepy, creepy Uncle Joe has also announced that he is running for the presidency of the United States. And you remember the media and that, oh my goodness, this unprecedented hype. (gasps) Will he, won't he, will he, won't he. The Game of Thrones finale had less buildup than him. The result? He announced in Pennsylvania, but his campaign got this little hall and they bust 600 union employees into it to sit sullenly listening to Biden and to end the breathless tension about whether he would run. The energy in that room was less enthusiasm than, well, at best, stolid resignation. Politico, I'm no friend to the right, obviously, described the mood there as, quote, listless. Contrast that for a minute. Contrast it teeming thousands outside of the Orlando Sentinel Blue Zone, waiting for hours and even days to get inside, 20,000 people cramming the arena, thousands more standing outside. The enthusiasm, there's that word again, is through the roof. I mean, quite light, literally, as far as the cheers were concerned, you could hear it outside of the arena. And I have got a link in the blog, and it's to a YouTube video of one of the sections of Trump's speech and the crowd reaction. I strongly suggest you go to the written blog and you click on that link. I don't know what's happening here. I truly don't. But there is an intangible but palpable sense that something historic is happening. The energy in that Orlando rally was not angry. It wasn't resentful and sullen and resigned and pissy. In fact, that energy didn't even remotely resemble the mood of any Democrat rally I've seen to date from any of their candidates. The best they get is is Elizabeth Focahontas Warren snarling her way into an applause line. The the Trump rally energy, it was beyond upbeat. It it was beyond exuberant. The only way I can think of to describe it was a soaring ebullience. These are the average Americans. They like pride in their nation. They don't sneer at the idea of nationalism. It just means you're proud of your country. These are the people who now have jobs. They've got upward mobility. They have wage increases. These people, their only disappointment with their president was his inability to stop the disaster pouring across our southern border. But they know who to blame for that failure, and as sure as hell isn't Donald Trump. Watch these people. Watch them now, and watch them as the campaign unfolds. Something is happening here. But all right, you say, admittedly, cheering is easy. Cheering is one thing. Translating those cheers into some kind of hard support, now that's another. Can he do it? Well, I don't know. Trump just once again trounced his opponents handily. Did you know that in the 24-hour period after that that announcement was made, he expanded his already pretty formidable $40 million war chest with a record $25 million in a single day. The Republican National Committee now has $100 million dollars. For scale, Trump just raised 21 times the amount Obama had garnered at this point in his re-election campaign. And that was a successful effort, remember? (laughs) How can we forget? And here's a little point, something that puts paid to this democratic smug idea that they own the American little guy. Did you know that 98.79%, let's just say 99% will round up, right? 99% of all of those donations that came in, to Donald Trump are from small donors who can contribute less than $200 a piece. In fact, do you know the average donation that he gets is under $35? These are little guys, but they donate what they can. That's enthusiasm. That's people putting their money where their cheers are. That's people who will turn out to vote. And I'll tell you something, the Democrat organizers and Biden's campaign people, they can force any number of sullen union employees onto buses on election day. Trump doesn't need that. He has us deplorables, and we are beyond fired up. We are electric with enthusiasm, and you can't buy that. You can't bust that. You can't push-pull that into existence.
Thank you for tuning in to the Political Page Podcast today. Original blog articles, complete with a lot more information and great links to original source material, can be found anytime on politicalpage.net. That's politicalpage.net.